as it turns out, the art world really wants me to continue laundering money. <laughs> Our world loves money laundering. <laughs> so I proposed an extended version of the project, and then I've been lucky enough to get all this funding for it, you know, which is why I really can't say that I'm broke anymore. Hello, and welcome to Art Restart, where we explore how artists are reinventing their fields and building a new landscape for the arts. I'm Carlo Talenti, the producer and editor of this podcast, which is brought to you by the Thomas S. Keenan Institute for the Arts at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. In this episode, we'll be getting to know video essayist and performance artist Maura Brewer. Early in her career, Maura explored the relationship between representations of women in Hollywood films and the structures of contemporary capitalism. Through several video pieces, often tongue-in-cheek, she focused on the actor Jessica Chastain, who at the time was being typecast in films such as Zero Dark Thirty as a steely go-getter who paid a steep personal price for her ambition. In recent years, though, her focus has shifted from representations created by capitalism to capitalism's actual underlying financial structures. To wit, she is deep into a years-long project titled Private Client Services that explores how the rich launder money through art acquisition and sales. In this project, which she's documenting, of course, meticulously through video and writing, Mora herself is doing the very thing she is studying, namely laundering money through art. Well, you know what they say, you learn by doing. Now, Moore is not entering this world entirely dewy-eyed because guess what? In addition to being an artist, she's also an experienced professional private investigator. (laughs) Now, do I bring you interesting guests or what? Moore's work has been exhibited at spaces including MoMA and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago and is in the collection of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Her projects have appeared in The Guardian, CBS News, and The Paris Review. She's a 2023 Guggenheim Fellow, a 2022 Creative Capital Fellow, and a recipient of the Fellowship for Visual Artists at the California Community Foundation and the City of Los Angeles Master Artist Fellowship. Morris spoke to me from her home in Altadena, California. I started by asking her how she developed her very specific voice and vision as an artist. I went to art school uh, for undergrad. I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I actually came, like, when I was really young and kind of trying to figure it out, I was making, like, um, soft sculpture. I came through the fiber and material studies program uh, at the Art Institute. Yeah. But it's also, like, a kind of interesting school where you don't have a major and can kind of do whatever you want. So I ended up working closely with a video artist named Vanilyn Green, um, who's an amazing uh, feminist uh, video essayist. I was very interested in quilting and found materials and feminist histories. And I started to get more interested in like working in a less abstract way, you know, like I was always kind of reading and writing And I was interested in kind of putting that energy into my work. And it felt like, you know, video, um, especially sort of like appropriative techniques in video, like my videos combine, you know, footage from YouTube and movies and um, text messages and all kinds of things, you know. And so I think that those sort of feminist histories where you're kind of combining a bunch of different found materials, you know, which comes out of like this sort of waste not want not ethos it became a kind of funny sort of like natural fit to move from, yeah, like a a kind of fiber practice into video, even though those things sound far apart. I don't think they are that far apart at their heart. They're both, it's collage practice, right? (laughs) A lot of times I think of my video as just sort of like working with a lot of like found garbage, you know, like bad movies, (laughs) clips from video games, weird footage that people have shot on the internet, and then recombining that stuff like it's recycling, you know. I'd never heard the phrase waste not want not applied to video, as in why, <laughs> as in why create, why spend energy creating something new when there's plenty of exi- existing material to recreate into something new? Yeah. Well, and also, I, I know, you know, to 
to be straightforward, I was and still am most of the time kind of broke. And unless I'm less broke now than I was, but I was very broke, you know, as a, as a young artist. And, and so, you know, there is like a real like economy, you know, there's like a political economy, but then there's also just an economy to like, how are you going to make your work, you know? And so video, you know, digital media is amazing because, you know, you have your computer and that's basically all you need. You can kind of uh, remix a kind of universe of endless materials. So how in the course of your artistic career did you get into the PI work? Um, yeah, it was very surprising. Um, I taught college adjunct um, for 10 years. So later I've been told that this is just kind of how people get into this industry. But I was starting, you know, as I alluded to, starting to make video work where I was um, – I sort of taught myself how to pull public records because I was doing this Jessica Manafort work. And so I was like, oh, you know, like I would read about her divorce and then I'd be like, oh, let's find the divorce and use the real document in the video. And so uh, one of my uh, employers, he's um, sort of uh, sometimes in the art world himself. Um, the private investigation industry is full of interesting people. We had a mutual friend and he came across my work and basically offered, you know, was like, oh, you're already doing this, but I can train you to do a better job. <laughs> um, so um, so then I started working for him kind of part time for a couple of years. And then he was like, you know, you're not going to really learn unless you do this full time. So then I left teaching and have been doing the PI work full time for the last two years and it's been a really excellent, you know, really amazing training. You don't really go to school for it, right? So it's like on the job training. It's more like apprenticeship. So what types of cases are, are do you, it constitute m most of your work? Um, yeah, we do. It's really all over the map. We're a small firm and we do all kinds of things. Um, we do do work for documentary filmmakers occasionally. We're, we're based in Los Angeles. Um, so there's a little, a little bit of that kind of work. We also do a lot of litigation research. So people who are being sued or going to sue someone else, we might work for lawyers to background people who may be deposed, for example. I've been very involved in a political opposition case, which I'm really super into. <laughs> uh, so, so we do some some political opposition research, which is like, you know, we're working for a political organization to research their uh, adversary. Oh, um, so you're digging up dirt on the adversary. There's movies about this stuff. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people doing that kind of work out there in the world. Um a lot of stuff like that, yeah. <laughs> How has that work? Because you've been honing that that expertise. How has that influenced your art making? And how has your artistic spirit informed that work? It's been fantastic, actually. It's been a really great sort of like back and forth connection. The work I'm doing now is, for the last couple of years, is all about money laundering. And in order to do that work, I've been learning how to launder money. Um, part of what I'm interested in is what are the corporate mechanisms for laundering money? So like, how could you create a corporate architecture across multiple jurisdictions? And like, how do you make that architecture anonymous? How do you shield yourself? So the PI work has been very useful in terms of understanding how to read corporate records uh, and kind of financial documents of all kinds. There's a world of information that I didn't know existed that's all in the public record. It's interesting, like, what you can find and what you can't find. You know, like, Delaware, for example, really is kind of a black box. <laughs> you know, there's a reason that people talk about Delaware. It's very hard to get information about companies that are formed in Delaware. And even with like, you know, on the on-site research that's there's we can get some things, but there's a real limit to it. So it's been interesting just to kind of uh, learn that stuff firsthand. Well, I so we're talking about private client private client services now, right? Your latest project. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. yeah, I like because it's it's so fascinating to me. Tell me how you hone honed in on what you wanted to do, and the steps that it took to to create it. That work came pretty directly out of this work of where I got. I made a couple of videos about Jessica Manafort, um, who's Paul Manafort's daughter, and 
she is a filmmaker in Los Angeles. Um, she's made two feature length films and I got interested in her because, well, I, I was just kind of reading about Paul Manafort. There was like a very long, um, really excellent profile of him in the Atlantic several years ago. You know, he's just really interesting character, sort of minor political figure in a lot of ways, but has been in the middle of all kinds of like the worst shit, <laughs> you know, for his entire career. And it's sort of halfway through this article, there's like a little aside, you know, that one of his daughters is a filmmaker and that he's funded her work. <laughs> so, so I got just cur really curious, you know, like, because he was being uh, indicted for money laundering. And so I was wondering, you know, well, if he was funding her work and the work was happening around the same time that he was, you know, involved in all these criminal activities then could her films be have been a vehicle for money laundering? And if that's the case, the thing I was really curious about is sort of a silly question, which is, is there an aesthetics of money laundering? Like, could you watch her films and understand in some way, could you read them you know, do a kind of close reading of them that might like reveal <laughs> their their material origin, you know, which is a kind of impossible idea. And of course, I didn't have any proof one way or the other, you know, couldn't really come to any conclusions about whether or not the films are vehicles for money laundering. But I kind of did my best to, <laughs> to reconsider them through that lens. And so then I was thinking, so then I was sort of, I, I made these two, these two videos about her two films. And then I, I was kind of thinking like, well, this is all like, this is great. And, you know, it's been interesting, but in some ways this is all a kind of displacement because, you know, money laundering, like I don't have to look at film, you know, to think about money laundering, like money laundering is happening in the art world all the time and I'm an artist. And so why don't I just see if I can launder money myself through art acquisition instead of looking at the way somebody else might do it through film, you know? So then I thought, why, well, I'll just, I'll do this performance where I try to launder money through art acquisition <laughs> and that's private <laughs> client, client services. Um, and then I'll so make a video So first you need to get the money that. to launder, right? Where, where, <laughs> right. where, where did you get money to launder? Um, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Well, seriously, though, I, I think, you know, I people always ask me that question. And it's a, and of course, it's like the, you know, it's the most interesting question. So I have to refuse to answer it. But, you know, the thing that I'm really interested in is, you know, money laundering is a crime that happens after a crime. You know, it's like the second crime. And it's the boring crime. Like, whatever the first crime is, is interesting. The second crime is boring. It's about, like, a accountants and paperwork and corporations and, you know, moving money from one place to another. And so I decided, you know, that it would be in the work's best interest, probably in my own best interest, but in the work's best interest to not talk about, you know, where does the money come from, but rather to talk about where does the money go, you know. And and also, you know, the the more I work on this project and understand the kind of financial landscape of the very wealthy as much as I could understand it, money laundering is like a flashy word and it is definitely a problem in the art market a big problem uh there was a senate investigation about it recently the more the more i kind of research this world the thing that i, I find myself actually interested in is tax evasion which sounds you know is is more boring and maybe doesn't like get you as many grants but um it it uses a lot of the exact same financial mechanisms as money laundering and oftentimes is technically legal in the ways that it's done like, you know, maybe not tax evasion, but tax avoidance, right, is a kind of hu huge pastime of the rich. And they use art to avoid taxes all the time. So why why is art so useful to rich people for reasons other than aesthetics or intrinsic value? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, the question of intrinsic value gets to the heart of why it's, it's useful, because art really doesn't have intrinsic value, or if it does, like, who the hell knows what it is, right? Like, art is so incredibly speculative. Prices are extremely fungible. Art is purely worth whatever we say it's worth, right? Whatever the market will bear is what it's worth. I was recently reading a 
paper about fraud in the art world, and it was looking at, uh, I think it's Inigo Philbrick, who's her famous art fraudster. And it was kind of, it was this sort of great paper, research paper um, that was like really laying out like what his scams were. He was convicted. He's in prison right now. But he basically like a lot of them revolved around this one Basquiat painting um, that he sold and then resold and then resold to different people for varying amounts over and over again. He would sell it to one person and then he would sell it to one person then and then go turn around and sell it to someone else, not having told them that it had already been sold. Right. He would sell it to one person for like $12 million and then turn around and sell it to another person for $22 million, all like in the same month. So there's no way that that Basquiat painting is worth, you know, double in a month period. But then what is it worth, actually? It's worth whatever the person believes it's worth. Um, so as a vehicle for speculation, art is really excellent. Is private client services completed? No, it's not. I made a version of it and I thought it was completed. And then as it turns out, the art world really wants me to continue laundering money. <laughs> the art world loves money laundering. <laughs> so I proposed an extended version of the project and then I've been lucky enough to get all this funding for it, you know, which is why I really can't say that I'm broke anymore. The next phase of the project that I'm involved in now is the, the first version I did through a shell corporation in Wyoming. Which is the new Delaware, I understand, right? That's what I was told. So I mm -hmm. thought I'd check it out. Yeah, found a very good service that made a corporation for me. It was very easy. So for this version, I'm doing a kind of more complex version in which I'm making a corporate structure across multiple international jurisdictions. I'm working with a lawyer who sort of advised me as to which jurisdictions would be most amenable to both art acquisition and money laundering. <laughs> and then I'm visiting each of those locations. I want to guess. Yeah. I want to guess. Can I guess? Please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Monaco. Uh, close. Uh, uh, Malta. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Oh, Monica. I was, I was close with Monaco. Oh, I don't know. It's not France. It's not Italy, is it? No, but also, but also, you know, close. Close. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you reveal where you'll be traveling? Yes, yes. So I'm going to Luxembourg. I feel like ah. Luxembourg is, is close to Monaco in spirit. Yes, um, that's right. Luxembourg, Switzerland, Hong Kong, the Cayman Islands, where I've already been. I went to that one. And, and then I think I'm going to Malaysia as well. There's a finance center that's kind of new in Malaysia uh, on an island called Labuan. Oh my God, Maura, listen to you. What? <laughs> you have created this. You, you've created, I mean, talk about representation. You're living the life of this high flying <laughs> money wanderer. Did you ever think this would be your life? No, but I'm very amused by it. <laughs> It does feel like kind of the best joke I've ever thought of. <laughs> I'm very, very pleased. Yeah. When you picture the project as being completed, how is it going to be presented to viewers? Um, so I'm making a video that's kind of, you know, a travel video, uh, actually an, an installation. That'll be part of it. And then I think I'm also going to be um, producing a publication in conjunction with this um, lawyer that I've been working with. It'll be a kind of guide, a guide to money laundering in the art world. Considering that you said until recently you were pretty broke, how has all this research into money and art affected your own understanding of money and of the value of your own art? Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I think most artists have a complicated relationship to money. One thing I'll say is that I do think that I became interested in this work because I like want money you know <laughs> like there's like a certain amount of desire that's real for me and you know i think hopefully that'll be part of the work right i think that's important actually um to to think about and address i think one of the things that i'm interested in is thinking about the kind of gap between like when you're an artist you know i this is the thing that i really loved about teaching is I would go, you know, I was teaching in an art school college, and I would go to my, my students' studios, and they're undergrads, you know, and like young, and 
a lot of times they're just like do it, like making this work, you know, making their thing. And they're like doing something that's like pretty crazy, you know, or whatever, you know, just like some, something and they're doing it. And it's, they can't really always tell you exactly why they're doing it, <laughs> but they're do, but they need to do it. <laughs> you know how they need to do that thing. Like, I just always thought that was so like incredibly moving, actually like really beautiful the just sort of like drive that humans have to create things. I do think that creativity is like a fundamental human need. I know that it has been in my own life. And I think that when you are driven by something that isn't primarily monetary in our culture, you are taken advantage of. It becomes very, very easy to be exploited. Because there's somebody who will figure out how to make money on what you're doing, right? Especially, you know, as someone who, you know, has always had, like, I've always, you know, been a working artist, but always had, like, a variety of day jobs, you know, like, and student loans and all that stuff. And also, like, you know, really committed to video art, which does not have a huge market application, not many video collectors in the world, you know, and that's not really the history of video I was ever interested in. I like the kind of video that you can just like watch on the internet, you know, and uh, thinking about like my path and how tricky it's been for me, you know, I've been very lucky, but you know, like I've had to work really hard to be able to make the kind of work that I want to make with any kind of sense of freedom. And then thinking about my students who were paying, you know, double what I was paying to go to school and really crippled with debt in a way that I couldn't even totally understand. And I was just thinking like, you know, what kind of world are we making? Like, are there going to be video artists and performance artists anymore? <laughs> you know, like, is there room for a kind of making or creativity or expression that is um, not driven by the market? And then, you know, the flip side of that is that, you know, artists who make work that does have market application, um, who maybe show in commercial galleries, you make your work in your studio and it has one kind of life and existence for you. And then it goes out into the world and it has a radically different kind of existence as a financial vehicle. From which the original artist rarely benefits, right? Yeah, absolutely. And often like that can become a very precarious situation, you know, like you all of a sudden, like, you know, you might be like a young artist and you become like a kind of thing for a minute and your prices go up, but then the market can't sustain that. So then your prices go down. Right. And then you can't and then you kind of can't recover from that. Like that's a really common story in the art world. And so it's like the thing that you made, which is sustaining you intellectually, emotionally, is also part of this larger system, which is structurally oppressing you. And I think that, you know, what I want to make work about is I, I want what I want to do is sort of close the gap, like bring together the sort of experience of being a working artist in the studio with then like, how does this artwork kind of function within a the larger sort of economy, and kind of bring those experiences closer together. How can artists resist being the oppressed ones? How, given what you learn about these rigged systems, that rarely benefit the artists? What tools can artists arm themselves with to give them more leverage, more power? Uh, <laughs> I don't, I'm not always, I can, I, I, I do have an answer for that question. Um, I don't think, I will say, I don't really think of my work as activist. Like I, you know, I've been telling people that my work is like, I could think of it as like landscape painting, except, you know, the landscape is financial. It's like the art market or something, you know? Right. Um, so, so I'm no, and I, in, I hope I wasn't, yeah. yes, I, I totally yeah. understand that, but I'm just asking <laughs> because you are more educated about this world than most people. So aside from your art, where I'm just asking about your opinion, right. I guess, you know? Yeah. Um, I guess, and I guess my opinion is that like, I think like I'm a, you know, socialist and, I don't think that there's any way to kind of operate within capitalism without both perpetuating capitalism and and also perpetuating your own exploitation within capitalism. Like, I just think that I don't think there's any sort of space of purity, you know, like if I'm being like practical, like I think everybody has to just kind of figure out how to survive. You know, the things that I believe in are and that I think we should be demanding is like I believe in a return 
uh, to government funding for the arts, you know, like a lot of, you know, one of the, the grants I received recently, Creative Capital, was explicitly created in the wake of the government ending NEA funding for visual artists because there was no fund, you know, because the government, you know, the, the federal government took that away and because they decided, you know, uh, that uh, visual artists were too controversial to receive funding. And since then, there's been like a kind of terrible vacuum. You know, if you go back and look at the WPA, like the social social programs of the early 20th century, like some of the most iconic American art was being made, you know, through those programs where the gov- federal government was directly paying artists to make work. Um, and I think that that is a huge value to society and it should come back. Right. Work that still beautified so many of our spaces today. Yeah. Incredibly important work that has intrinsic value and that I think should be publicly supported, you know, not not supported through private nonprofits or private charity, but supported through the government directly. Um, I think that's incredibly important. I also think that artists should demand um, real reforms within the education system. I don't think artists should be paying ninety thousand dollars a year to get bachelor's degrees uh, with no, you know, job applicability. And up until very recently, that was not how the world worked. My mom is an artist. She went to art school um, at PNCA, you know, back in the day, and she had no student loans because she was able to work a job and pay her tuition. Are you still working as a private investigator or do you not have time for that or the need for that? Oh, no, I'm, I'm doing that. I'm okay. doing that. I'm just, I'm just, I'm always, you know, I'm always have like lots of jobs, but um, I really, I really enjoy that work. I'm just doing it a little bit less to have more time for my practice, which is like an incredible luxury to even be able to say those words, you know. Uh, I know this is first and foremost on your mind, private client services, but do you have any, do you have an idea of what you might be diving into next? Uh, Yeah, always. (laughs) (laughs) I always have like um, a long list of things I'd like to be working on. Some of them are bad ideas. And so we'll, (laughs) we'll figure, figure that out. But um, some of them might stick. I am interested in making a piece about the private investigations industry. And particularly, I'm interested in public knowledge and private knowledge. I'm interested in non-disclosure agreements, which I've signed as a PI, and like what the kind of, I guess, economy of information is in the world. So I have something kind of percolating about that that I'll probably get into more deeply when I'm done laundering money, if I'll I'll ever be allowed to stop laundering money. If you'd like to read a longer version of this interview and learn more about Mora, just head to uncsa.edu slash art restart. We really rely on your word of mouth. So if you enjoyed this episode, won't you please let your friends know about it? And if you have ideas about artist changemakers you'd like us to interview, please let me know. You can find me on Instagram at PC Talenti. Our theme music is by Shanghai Restoration Project. I'm Piercarlo Talenti, and on behalf of the Thomas S. Keenan Institute for the Arts, thank you for listening. <laughs>